So welcome everybody to Gosa TV and to another amazing interview with an amazing friend, Irene Yu. Irene is a counselor and she is also a personal friend. Irene, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, Irene, uh, tell us a little bit about what exactly do you do at the school? I know you're in the school of, uh, in the district of Santa Ana, I believe. Is that correct? Um, Huntington Beach. Union. Okay. Uh, so, well, we'll start with that. Why don't you tell us uh, where you're at and the last maybe year, what is it that you've been doing there in Huntington Beach? Um, so I am their college and career specialist. So in essence, I hone in on the different college and career opportunities for my ninth through 12th graders. We have about 3,600 students in our, uh, in our school. But I think <laughs> in a nutshell, I help with their future plans. What a wonderful thing. And also, I don't want to miss on the chance to say how fun it is to know that you are a, now I don't know the official term, a Costco player. Is that what you call it? Oh, it's called cosplay. Cosplay. So cosplay is a, is a combination of two words. So the first word is cause, um, is, I guess, costume. And then the second is play. So you're costume playing. So okay. cosplay. So you're, in essence, reliving some of your favorite characters. Um, can be anybody from like a Disney princess to a villain to, or you can make somebody up and just portray that character. So mm. it's costume playing. So I am, I guess, off the nine to five hours, I'm a, the cosplay counselor. <laughs> so <laughs> I dress up on the weekends and go to conventions and use that as an avenue to also introduce different important counseling or guidance topics to my viewers. Yes, I love that. And I think it's a wonderful combination. And so, well, we, uh, I wanted to talk to you today because, you know, it's, this is personal for me and for a lot of parents in terms of what is going to happen with our undergrads in high school, with those who are in college, with those preparing to go to college. Um, like many viewers and many people on Goso TV, we're parents. I, I, we're parents, Rochelle and I, of three kids. One is 21, who is at Long Beach State, and she's not really happy with the online stuff because she likes the accountability of being in the classroom. Our middle child, who's 18, and this is her first year at also at Long Beach, she is happy because she couldn't stand being in the room with 4,000 other students. And then our, our younger son, who's 16, he's a junior in high school, he's more concerned about his friends and his girlfriend and some of the more social aspects of high school that he's missing out on. Yeah. But, you know, he's also thinking about the SAT and some of those things. So first, I wanted to paint the picture of how up in the air things are. How does it feel for you to be a school counselor in these, in these waters? It's tough because I guess at the core of it, I love being in control of things, even though even prior to COVID-19, I, um, you don't really have control of anything. Right. So, mm. um, but I think this makes this situation makes it so much more that you really don't know what's going to happen. At least for our school district, a lot of our decisions are not just based our own site so we have to take in consideration what other schools within our district have the capabilities to do what our mayor will say and what our governor says so there's a lot of different steps to be able to kind of make decisions so one person well they shouldn't one person shouldn't just go ahead and like go charge forth because there are other consequences and ripple effects that happens when you make a decision so that's why at least our school district has been very very slow to make certain decisions. I mean, only last week we were just given instructions on grading for <laughs> the remainder of the semester. And you can imagine that that's a, that puts a huge pressure on teachers who are at home, probably also taking care of their own kids who are also trying to figure out how to help them navigate education um, while also taking their you know, if they have six classes, five or six classes of 30 kids each, that's a lot of, that's a lot of work to do. And then depending on, I guess, their technology situation at home, do they have a scanner? Can they accept 
JPEGs, how to degrade. Like there's, there's just a lot of extra additional steps that you may need to take. So it's just tough, but we're, we're just trying to make it through day by day, one step at a time. Yeah, I thought it was important to start with with the reality of it because I think it, it unites us to know that everyone is struggling. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like they say, the stages of grief, obviously the first one is shock and denial. And, I mean, obviously you know about that. How Speaking of that, maybe we can stay with this a little bit in terms of the, the upheaval. What do you, where do you see our schools, maybe your school particularly, or your teachers, et cetera, in terms of the stages of grief? Where do you think we're at? Hmm. I think we're still in the very early stages of grieving just because I don't think many people are accepting what's what is happening um unfortunately i belong in a or fortunately or unfortunately i however you want to look at it um i belong in an area where um people are exercising their 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 freedom of speech and their rights um to have things the way they were that's just not the way it is right now but um, with those type of actions, there are going to be repercussions and there are going to be consequences. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but there have been many protests in Huntington Beach. And No, tell me. I, I do not know. <laughs> I think it's important to know uh, because this is what people are doing. But what's going on? So for the past couple of weeks, there have been protests at Huntington Beach. Um, I don't imagine it's only parents and families from Huntington Beach, but um, one of the locations is in Huntington Beach. So I imagine that a number of those individuals are also members of my community who want things to be the way they were. The, the way they were. So really fighting hard to have an in-person graduation, really fighting hard to go back to the way it used to be. Um, and while they may have very good reasons for wanting to exercise their freedom of speech, I think that that is going to prolong this current situation because if you're not wearing a face mask, maybe you don't have the symptoms like a fever or cough or whatever, but you still might be a carrier and you might pass it on to somebody else. And so if you pass it on, as you can imagine, um, this virus is like glitter, right? So it just gets everywhere. And with that, you're just going to see increased numbers in the hospital. And we're just going to be probably staying home even longer. So um, yeah. I think because there are a number of people who still have that mindset, it leads me to believe that we're still in the very early stage of the grieving process. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, I was I relate to, I relate that because I think it was Thursday, Friday, as I mentioned, Rochelle's a principal of an elementary school in Norwalk, and uh, perhaps you know different demographics here in terms of our, our context, but nonetheless, parents are parents, and so she's. I think the the teachers and, and you know the teacher kind of gene is very much of a of a control person you know that yeah. that's what makes them effective you know they they want to know how to manage these you know all these different personalities they need to be in control yeah and so I think mostly from the teachers that's where she's feeling the pressure to know yeah. and to keep things as as normal as possible and you know she as a principal has been obviously knowing where she's at herself, guiding the conversation. You know, she has 20 people on the Zoom call and they're all trying to ask questions and she's listening from, to the board and she has board meetings on Tuesday nights on Zoom and, you know, she's balancing all these things, doing an amazing job in her first year even. But I think it was Friday or Saturday, she, she was in tears. We're talking about she has these signs that haven't come in. And I think she finally understood that she has been in denial herself, that she hasn't been able to, um, to 
I don't even know if catch up is the right word, but to move through this because it's just, it's, it's because she's a teacher, she's a principal. She wants those kids to enjoy their end of the year celebrations. Yeah. But we are also human as well. So yeah. I think when you are put in a leadership role, yes, you do have the responsibility to make decisions, but you're just as susceptible to having, you know, um, the different feelings as well. And if the longer you hide those feelings or just keep them inside, it's only going to hurt you unless you really kind of process and figure out what you're really feeling. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, we were talking uh, right after that conversation and I was, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those crazy futurists who maybe is out of touch with reality sometimes, but it, it, it helps us because she is in the moment. She is an Enneagram one. So she's very much in the moment and she deals with what's in front of her. And I was talking about moving forward and some church stuff that I'm doing. You know, we've lost a bunch of income in terms of rentals. So now we have to go to plan B, plan C. And I think she was telling me that it finally helped her or she had a conversation with one of her other principals and it all kind of, I guess, clicked. I think even last night she was telling me this over the weekend that she is more ready to, to, to lead her school forward because she's catching up to the fact that I think she was hoping that this would end. Yeah. Like May 15th, like, Friday. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that funny? (laughs) We had said May 15th in some circles, right? That's like Friday. (laughs) Imagine, right? Some people thought that I thought by Easter we'd be over this, but it's, it's kind of a a, a time to give each other grace as we all move through this at different levels, some protesting, some grieving, some maybe moving forward. Yeah. Well, Let's move on to the second uh, question that I had, and that is, we talked about opportunities and all the marketers and all the, as I said, the, the business people and all these people will tell you that this is an opportunity, that in 2008, that after the crash, that's when Uber uh, started or Netflix changed her whole yeah. plan and, and, and they became you know, what, they, what they are now. Did you and know so, that... Mm-hmm. Um, Sir Isaac Newton created calculus during the plague. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> so, yeah, there are opportunities for, you know, problems that become right at the forefront. And if you can find a solution, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to kill two birds with one stone. So. so let's talk practical about, let's say, an 11th grader like my son, who's not only missing out on girlfriend and friends, but <laughs> the SAT Mm-hmm. What are the opportunities? What do kids have to do in light of some of these changes? What are the opportunities for them? In terms of extracurricular activities or in terms well, of... Well, I would say more academic? SAT and academics, yeah. Well, I guess one great thing is that many of the different tests are um, have free online resources like Khan Academy. Um So I guess that is a way to, in some essence, like level the playing field to um, make the information accessible to all students. So you don't have to have thousands of dollars to go throw um, at like a tutoring company to help train your kid. The information is available for all students. Um, And then second, there are a number of universities that are not requiring the SAT or ACT for the fall. So if you're not a good test taker, maybe that's great news because then you don't have to take the test. Right. Um, So I guess with, but with that, because they're not using that as an evaluation criteria, that means that you need to somehow showcase that you are worthy of them accepting you as an applicant. So my theory for, for example, for the Cal States, they only looked at, in previous years, your SAT or ACT plus your GPA. It's a very data-oriented approach in reviewing applications. 
But now that you're taking a whole component out of the evaluation criteria, they can't just use one criteria. They can't just have GPA. There are some schools that have grade inflation and other schools may not have as many AP class, class offerings. So why would it just wouldn't be equitable, right? If one school offers 20 AP classes, whereas another school may only offer three. So a student who took all three classes in one school versus a student who took three out of the 20, it's just not equitable. So I think that's why they utilize the SAT and AT as a somewhat even criteria to evaluate students. But because many of schools don't know if SAT or ACT is going to be a viable testing opportunity. I mean, we're still playing it day by day on whether, you know, having a large group of students take a test, if that's something that is even feasible for the next couple of months. I mean, I know wishful thinking they want to take the test in, or they want to conduct the test in August for the SAT and ACT, but, you know, we just don't know Mm -hmm. at that time if it's safe for that group of students to be able to test, you know? Um, so my theory for, at least for the Cal States is maybe they'll add like an essay component to the exam, um, to the, to admission, um, evaluation. Mm -hmm. So with that, that means you need to have something to write about, right? A lot of COVID (laughs) stories. (laughs) A lot of COVID stories. Well, they hopefully they're good COVID stories, like, of of didn't die. Right. (laughs) Or that you're a great person, like you're taking care of other people, right? Like your your family or um, the essential workers, like hospital um, hospital staff, right? So there is opportunity. You just have to think inside the box and how you're going to approach it. It's not it doesn't have to be as cookie cutter as you had in the past with get as high as SAT scores as I can get a you know, four point plus GPA, be captain of this sports team. So instead of that formula that many of the students may try to follow, you have periods that are like, that are not accessible at this point right now. So you, I guess in some ways, maybe it's great because then you have to take more initiative to do things, right? Mm. So I always tell students um, in the past prior to this pandemic, that going to take a community college class or taking an ROP class to learn other skills outside of the classroom, that's always going to be beneficial, whether it's helping you discover that's the career pathway you want to take, or if it's absolutely not what you thought it was and you don't want to do more. So I think that those are opportunities that you definitely want to take advantage of. And I think I had a link on my, on my like, cosplay counselor Facebook page that there are certain universities that are making this free for students. So I think there was one link that I put where the UC is offering a free college class that high school students can take. Okay. Um, make sure to link that at the bottom of this video. Sure. So I think that you, you know, you just have to take more initiative. You won't, <laughs> or you and your parents, I guess, <laughs> take more mm-hmm. initiative to see the resources out there to really help you advance. Um, So that's really great for students who can't, who are very innovative or want to learn more. And that thirst and hunger to want to learn, I think that's something that might be missing in in this generation, at least from the standpoint of where I am. I see a lot more parents who are um, very aggressive on what's best for their child. And while I know the intentions are good, you can't always hold their hand. Um, Because when you go to college, the college professors or admission reps, they don't talk to the parents because all the students are adults at that point. There's lots of like FERPA um, rules and stuff with sharing information. So starting that earlier on in high school, the transition won't be as rocky um, if you allow the students to make those type of proactive decisions and kind of calls early on. (laughs) That's amazing what you're saying. I mean, you're right on. Like I'm just thinking as you're talking of 
you know, as I mentioned, we have a 16 year old junior in high school and because of our cultural home and we have half white culture, half Latino culture, we have this combination for our kids. And I talk about culture a lot because, because parents are the ones that are either handholding or controlling or I don't know what to do. I don't speak the language. So that's why to me this is very interesting. And obviously being myself an immigrant, it's, it's, I, I can relate to parent, parental involvement. But my point is because of the dual home that we have, Rochelle has always been very right on or strict, you could say, on getting your driver's license the very first day that you qualify, you know, at 50 and a half. And we, we all our three kids, not only did they get their license, but they all have their cars and pay for their own gas and they all have their jobs. And, and that's very American, right? And it's a very good thing. On my end, I mean, I was raised here, but for me, it's like comfort. Okay, how do we keep the the children safe and how do how do they how do i create a loving environment for them here and so we have i'm not going to say some perfect combination but at least a little bit of those of both of those things now with david who's not only a male but he's the youngest and you know how boys tend to grow up older and be mama's boys and all that stuff so then having these two cultures in him Last weekend, his father-in-law, who again comes from Rochelle's family and, 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 and demographic and all that stuff, culture, he had a work day in his garage. Very American, right? So he's going to have a work day. And so he invited all of his grandkids. I think there are three boys that he has. David, our son, Charlie, who's I think 14, and I think a little one, he's 10. So all three boys, and this is so my father-in-law came to his garage and they had a work day and they all earned $50, 50 I mean, that's like $1,000 for them. <laughs> and they brought books down from the attic and they swept the floor and they uh, took the boxes to the recycle bin and, and they loaded things in their grandpa, grandpa's car and they sweated, you know, they were just having a, one of those amazing work days. You know, I have never had a work day in my whole life, you know. And so now that night or that next day, I was telling David, son, do you want to start a YouTube channel? <laughs> maybe of music, of maybe drums, and, and we can do some marketing, some of the stuff I've learned. And he's just looking at me. Like, Dad, I, I just want to do something physical to make money. And I thought, wow, like, you mean you'd rather go sweat in a garage to make money than to just make videos and have YouTube send you checks? He's like, yeah, it's more your world. I don't want to do that. And I thought, wow, I'm so thankful for Rochelle's side of the family in terms of the work day, because he's finding out that he's more of a hands-on kid. He, yeah. he wants to, and thinking of what you just said about extracurricular, mm -hmm. I'm not sure you can write a, a paper on that, but perhaps he can talk about the value of working hard and of sweat equity, as his grandfather calls yeah. it. Absolutely. Interesting. What, what, are, what are parents doing as you're hearing Maybe as you think back on the last year, even what are parents doing or have done that you think, man, that's going to come in handy in this next season. Anything come to mind that parents have been doing that will actually be helpful for their kids coming up? Hmm. Can you be more specific? Yeah. Day? So I'm thinking like, are there any activities going back to activities? What kind of activities do you think? I mean, it's, it's a bad question. I'm asking a bad question. I, I mean to say, going back to David's thing, are there any sort of activities such as those that you think kids need to be looking into th this summer? Meaning getting a job, uh, getting your, you know, driving your car? Are there any sort of habits that kids need to be developing this summer so they can be ready for this new season coming up? I think nowadays work experience is so valuable. Not yeah. only one, are you 
able to earn some income, right? Um, and have ownership that that was the work that you put in. But I think a lot of kids these days, they don't val- they don't have a lot of those soft skills mm-hmm. that are really prized in all the corporations around the world now. Many of, I guess, I don't know if it's partly education or society that really pushes the academic or the book smarts. And while we want students to be educated, they seems very, very unbalanced. <laughs> and so I think having kids work a part-time job, whether it could be for mom and dad, it, mm-hmm. or it could be a retail job, um, I guess we'll have to see in the coming, you know, coming, coming weeks on uh, what that look like. But I definitely think that having an actual physical job where you go and do stuff, you're learning a lot of those necessary skills that you'll need in the workplace. So um, I think yeah. if parents can somehow make those connections with students, maybe like their friends might be able to take an intern on or, you know, a lot of it is very networking oriented. Um, so if you have a big reach to be able to help your kid with whatever industry they might be interested in, I think that is a really great way for students to, for parents to help their kids. That's so true. I was reading an article this weekend about, I forget what, something that kids can't do anymore. I mean, there's so many, but the article went on to say that things like Latter-day Saints and their missions uh, might be on the rise because of that, quote, work experience. And again, I don't know the travel restrictions and we, none of us know, but I mean, imagine, I mean, take, take away maybe aside the, the religious part of it, but imagine if I'm a business owner and I'm offering you a bike <laughs> and a mask and a job and a responsibility and a purpose and a mission, you're going to go around this neighborhood talking about X, Y, and Z and you're going to get paid for it. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing, it got me thinking about my church and internships. And I thought, how can we have work days back to my, my grandfather, my, my father-in-law, how can we have work days at our church? Not as, okay, just come and clean this thing for the kids ministry, but this is what's going to help you get into college because this is now work experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. Well, let's wrap this up, Irene, with um, what are your, what's your mood looking forward to this, this, these next few weeks? What, what is on your plate? What is um, kind of what's on your mind these days as you wrap up this year that can be of an encouragement to uh, some of the parents and some of the kids that may be watching? Um, I think, I think we've been working remotely for about roughly two months. And for me, of course, I would rather go back into the office and interact with the kids like face to face. Um, But I'm finding other avenues to grow as an individual and hopefully also reach out to all the different students. So um, as you've seen, my YouTube world has much more regular content now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess it's kind of a blessing in disguise because I am somebody who loves to go out and do things that um, are outside, you know, going traveling or trying new food places. And I think doing YouTube, while I think it's very rewarding, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And you have the script, you have the lighting, you have, you know, post-production, and then you have to upload and figure all the tags and all that stuff. So it's a, it's a process. And since I'm a one woman shop, as I'm sure you are a one man shop, it's very time consuming. But with this pandemic, it's given me an opportunity to use that time to be able to make all this happen. Because in the past, I would just say something like, oh, well, I have a concert to go to, or I want to go to this restaurant with this, these friends. And then those projects get pushed away and pushed away. So utilizing the time that you have right now, so maybe for a lot of families, you'll have more time to be able to spend with your kids. 
they're going to grow up before you know it. And by the time um, it's all said and done, they're going to be out of the house, right? And so you want to really just cherish the moment that you have, whether whatever that may look like, whether it be spending more time with your family or working on a project. So I know for me, like I said, I'm doing more YouTube. And I spent the last maybe month and a half working on like a certification um, to just add to my arsenal of professional development. So if I ever wanted to move up to the district level and um, work in that department, I at least have the tool set under my belt. So I think utilizing this time, it's really an opportunity for you to work on things that you've been pushing aside. And I can see at least from my, from my side, you know, I've earned the certification. It took me a while, but I got it. So I'm really happy. Great. And I have actual YouTube content that's out there that I'm hoping that some people will watch <laughs> and share. So having these like kind of sh at least short time periods, you can have results that show for it. So I hope that that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Very much. First, because I think that just you yourself, I mean, um, I guess just to reflect what I see in your videos and, and even in this interview, you yourself, and this is something I think for all of our listeners and viewers, you yourself are an encouragement. Just the fact that you as a professional woman who can't do all the things that you normally do, yet here you are with that smile on your face, with the understanding in the moment, present, grieving, there's loss, but yet there's optimism. I think that's the best gift that you are giving to your viewers, whether it's through this interview or online. As a parent, you know, we learn now having 21 years of parenting that it is that presence that matters the most to the children. It, it is that touch. I was reading a study that when you want your kid to open up in terms of like honesty and you're trying to really know what's going on, that just to put your hand on their shoulder will actually open up their minds and their bodies yeah, because of that touch. And I feel like even though we can't touch and we can't do any of that these days, that that face, you know, your, your, your smile on those videos, you know, your, all the cosplay and, and all of that energy that you bring and that our parents can bring, anyone who's watching this, that you can bring, it is, it is very powerful. It, it is academia and knowledge right now is failing us. We, we can't figure this out. Even the most amazing CDC doctors and all these people they can't figure this out. But what we can figure out is that touch, is that inviting your, your grandkids over to your garage to have that work day and to give them a few bucks, is to show up on YouTube and to say, here I am, I love you, here's some tools, go get them. And I think you, Irene, are an amazing example of doing that I want to encourage you and, and bless you and, and tell you to keep going, to, um, to keep showing up in the ways that you are with that, that positive, positive attitude, with that honesty, with the reality that you are losing something and that things are changing and even some of the tensions with politics and, and protests, how you are being in the moment, kindly listening to your parents and yet doing what you can. And so I just want to applaud you. And to close, why don't you give us uh, all your contact information, especially for YouTube, so that all of my viewers and listeners can go and uh, follow your content. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so I'm on pretty much all of the different social media platforms. If you go to youtube.com or it's cosplay counselor you'll be able to see both of my guidance as well as cosplay videos um, and I have some really really cool ones that are cooking up um, I'm doing some collaborations with some other cosplayers and I'm working I'm currently working on editing footage so um, I'm really excited about some of these these projects that I, I'm having um, that are that will be scheduled for the coming weeks and then if you love cosplay if you love um, I guess seeing the different comic book heroes or villains, 
you can go to my Instagram at instagram.com forward slash cosplay counselor, Facebook, TikTok, um, all the different media platforms. So cosplay counselor, um, I'm there for you and hope that you guys will come check it out. Awesome. Well, we'll put all those links and descriptions at the bottom of this video so that you guys can go and follow Irene. Thank you so much, Irene. You really are a joy and a joy bringer. And uh, I just, again, want to bless you and tell you what a joy it is to know you. Thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It was such a nice day to see you again as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Irene. All right. Have a good one. Okay.